definition, an entity consisting of n homogeneous units. Does that apply to the concept? If, if you said ice is a good, that means that all ice is a good. Any specific unit of ice, though, can be a different good from any other specific yeah. unit of ice. May or may not be. Yeah. But, it, but it requires somebody desiring the yeah. unit before yeah. you can even determine that. It's only when it's in an unused or undesired yeah. state that they are, in fact, the same. Right. But yeah. once somebody right. wants it, then so they are different. Can be different. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. value is coming to it. Right. Yeah. Just science that person. So right. Utility is part of the characteristic of the good. Yeah. Usefulness in a general yeah. sense. It's not, in a, in a very wide sense, usefulness. Like utility, in yeah. whichever way you want to take it, is part of the characteristic of a good. So it's not just the physical appearance. Yeah. So water, for example, is, is essential for Cold life. water or or, or warm, lukewarm yeah. water is not the same good. Let's take another example, just if I clarify food. this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, let's say you need, I don't know, let's say you need, usually, we haven't gotten the law of diminishing marginal utility yet, but it's coming, it's, we're teetering on it. Usually, the, if you have a supply of something, if you get one more unit, you value it less than the previous unit. You know, so if you have four eggs, you value the fifth egg less than the fourth than the other four. Uh, however, supposing you need five eggs to bake a cake, you can't bake a cake without four eggs. I don't know anything about cake baking, so I'm a shaky ground here. But anyway, <laughs> if you get the fifth egg, you can make a cake. So the fifth, you can then value the fifth egg more than the previous four eggs and pay more for it because by God, you're not going to cake. The fifth egg will now bring you a more first. Fifth egg is high utility and is more serviceable to you uh, than the other four eggs. See what I mean? So that you know each egg is the same physically. Fifth, I can bring this whole new thing, so you, you value it more highly. I, hope, I don't know if that clarifies it. Yeah, you can um, If you know that something is a good if it consists of homogeneous units, how do you know it consists of homogeneous units? What's the criteria? Well, the criteria. It seems to me that the ice cream and the ambience mm -hmm. and the whatnot do not constitute an entity that consists of homogeneous units. Well, it does, but it's, it's, um, it's, it varies. I mean, two ice person. cream cones in that restaurant. I mean, some see some person who might not doesn't care about the ambiance. Won't go. Won't, obviously, won't go to the test. Yeah. They're not going to buy that's, ice cream. Yeah, that's not my problem. Yeah. I, I understand what it means to say that this carbon of milk, the mm -hmm. milk of this carbon, mm -hmm. consists of homogeneous yeah. units. Each molecule of milk is exactly like right. each other. But what what are the units in the ice cream and this ice cream parlor and the ambience and whatnot, uh, which are like each other. I mean, it, it doesn't doesn't look as though ice cream is like ambience. Two ice cream, cream in Luke Test or ice cream in Swenson to be oh. ice cream uh, bash in Swenson. I understand the question. Uh, and the point is, you've got n homogeneous units. Yeah. She's saying only one unit, because there's more than one unit in this. Yeah. Yeah. There's not only the the ambience. There's not only the ice cream, there's also the thickness of the carpet, the number of yeah. waiters. Uh, well, your second, and this sort of stuff. So, your second, so your second, so your second, your second portion of ice cream would be enough. It, be so, is it, so is it good, mm. a multiple of goods sometimes? It's so one good could be yeah. several individual goods as well? It, isn't it an entirely yeah, subjective so. thing? Yeah. What, what, uh, what homogeneous is? So what's the yeah. criteria? Essentially, what, is, what the criteria is is if the people involved in whatever transaction is involved with the goods, if the people believe that they're homogeneous, mm -hmm. they're homogeneous for that value transaction. Value. Yeah. But somebody else observing it from outside may say that they're either are homogeneous and the people involved in the transaction don't see it that way, or Conversely, they might say those are not homogeneous, but the person involved. Yeah. It's the people involved in the transaction, their view of the transaction that's important, their view of whether the goods are homogeneous right. or not, not what any external observer sees. And what yeah. you're trying to, what, what seems to be going on here is people are trying to use this definition mm -hmm. as an objective definition, mm -hmm. get an objective definition of things out of it. Whether hom homogeneity in this sense is entirely a subjective thing from the people involved in the transaction. But right. people never think in terms of 
this is a good, good homogeneous units. Sure. <laughs> but, but look, look, you buy, let's say you buy a cup of a portion of ice cream at Swenson's or whatever it is, okay? You're not confronted with the question, should I buy a second portion? Well, a second portion, it's the same unit, okay? Now, however, you presumably value the second portion less than the first portion, so the heck with it, full or whatever, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, whatever the, the reason. So you have homogeneous units to that to that person. That so situation. it's two, when you compare two goods, it's <coughs> then that you say they have, consist of homogeneous units. I thought, looking at one good, I thought this was an analysis of one good, you know. Yeah. good consists of homogeneous units. Right. Yeah. Is that the uh, Austrian definition of the word good, or? Yeah. You, it's, it, it's, good sorry, one. it's comparative, isn't it? You're comparing values. Whether they're homogeneous. Yeah, that's. It's, it's well, not. You don't. You don't describe yeah. one good as. That's just too well. That's what the point. Yeah. Spencer's and say that ice cream, that ice cream parlor, and everything yeah. is one homogeneous. One, uh, ice cream at dash at Swenson's would be a unit. Okay, you have one portion, second portion, third portion. How much? How many <coughs> should you buy? So you're confronted with this. There's only a third portion, I'll say, you figure the heck with it. They come to a point where you don't buy it. The important point is just to yeah. know what uh, you mean by the word goods yeah. when you're speaking, mm -hmm. and the fact that it's different than in other economic systems. Uh, that we know what you're meaning when you say right. the word goods, right. and we understand that it's different than it is under other right. systems. Okay, well, let's see, let's give another angle here. Um, the, uh, the, the famous Coase theorem now. Very big in so called public choice economics among alleged free market economists. And the theorem is well, parts of it are, is that, uh, that uh, if, um, well, here's he, the actual example of Coase, a famous article written about 15 years ago. Uh, a railroad is chugging along, and a locomotive is pouring out smoke, and okay, smoke is lighting the orchards around it, the farms. Uh, <coughs> Then the, the question is, uh, these are costs, in other words, which the local the railroad is imposing on the farms. And uh, according to the coast people, the coastians, uh, public choice people, it's important for somebody to pay the cost. In other words, this is so-called externality or external cost. The railroad is imposing on the farmers. And they view it that it doesn't matter which whether, whether, whether the form, railroad has to pay the farmers or the farmers have to pay the railroad to stop it. In other words, uh, they, don't, they don't care whether the property right, the farmer has property rights which is being injured, or the railroad has property rights in the smoke, and, doesn't, and the farmers have to pay them off to stop, stop the smoke. Now that's, of course, because they, they don't have any theory of property rights. But the basic the point I want to focus on now is, their view is, okay, let's say the railroad, let's say the railroad is supposed to compensate the farmer. Um, the railroad then, Compensates at market price. So you have an orchard which is destroyed by the smoke. If the market price is, I don't know, $10,000, the railroad pays off $10,000, that's it. That takes care of it. The Austrian view, however, is that the, that the, um, the value to the former might not be the $10,000. It might be higher, let's say. You might love that orchard. The orchard came to happen his grandmother. The value to him, therefore, is a lot more. If they really compensate him, the railroad has to pay out a lot more. It's, it's like expropriating a little old right. house. Exactly. Science. There's just no way to evaluate it. Exactly. Really. And the thing is, and the th interesting thing here is, so the Wall Street position is that, that you can't evaluate just on market price because the valuations are different. Each individual has a different value. And the interesting thing is, you can't know what the value is. You see, because a little old lady can say, "This, I love this house so much, I need a million dollars." There's no way to. She might be a liar. There's no way to say she's it, a liar. It could. It could. It could be priceless. Right. Exactly. There's no reason why right. can't. Right. So, so no way. Right. This, this is not a voluntary yeah. market yeah. transaction. There's no way to figure yeah. out what this person is. The doing only way would be somehow go back in time, make her offers for the house in a yeah. free market situation, and say what she would sign and what she would take. Precisely. <laughs> but this is this whole theory of wealth, so-called welfare, welfare economics, where the government messes people up, confiscates their land, and whatever, and then just compensates them on the basis of what they think is the proper compensation. And the proper compensation is this so-called objective basis. Okay, the value was uh, 20, 20,000, we'll pay you 20,000. You can't do that if you don't know what the person's value was, the subjective value of this thing. Yeah. What about in the issue of property damage? You have uh, <coughs> one party suing the other. Um, um, what uh, uh, what Stan does Austrian economics take if, if my neighbor, uh, if my neighbor's dog mm -hmm. has been ruining my garbage all over my property, right. 
or, or has been biting my children. Mm -hmm. Obviously, my children yeah. are priceless, but right. uh, of course, I recognize that there's no market rate for children, not at least yet. <laughs> Maybe in a radio. We're but, working on uh, it. Yeah. I think the NDP will get our way. But uh, uh, what I'm wondering is that at least in some cases where things that are tradable on the market, mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you figure that people are going to be uh, reasonable in, on a settlement like that? I don't think there's any scientific way to do that. Yes, that's, that's the point. There's no. Uh, I mean, a judge or arbitrator or whatever you want to call it can make some kind of estimate, kind of talking about both parties, whatever you want to do it. But there's no, there's no scientific, in a sense, of precisely accurate way of, of saying yes, this is worth fifty thousand to you. It's just some, you know, just do it the best way you can. Right? And I don't see any of those. In other words, that, so even though the judge or arbitrator might do that, that doesn't mean that, the, that you know the person's value scale. Yeah. That's, that's uh, getting off into the theory. Yeah, it's going off into the legal theory. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's, it's just about time to take a break. Do you want to take that one more question? Yeah, well, just one more point. Footnote on this thing. See, what we're doing here, we're talking about there's a science of economics, there's a discipline of the theory, and then there's the art, which is applying it. And scientifically, we could say that to find a good like this, we can talk about all the missing money, all this other stuff. Applying it is an art in the sense that there the person who wants to apply it is a historian of the past or a forecaster of the future or an economist analyzing the current situation. You've got to just say, well, I think this is a good, right? In other words, I think the ice cream is a good, except for the case of Swenson's or whatever. And you sort of make, you make these judgments, but they can be fallible because there's no way to precisely say that it's a good if you're applying it to, uh, to the real world. So the, the art of economics requires judgment, entrepreneurship in a sense. It's not the same sort of precise science as, as the as the uh, theoretical structure. So, so a good, by definition, right. is what is available for sale. As yeah. soon as somebody wants to make a transaction, it can be something entirely different than what was originally offered. I wouldn't say entirely different. It's just a question of what you're, what you're buying in this thing. I'm going to talk to you at 3 o'clock. <laughs> I'm going to get this straight. <laughs> One more question. This is just a question. You were saying that... Uh, Difference between what the government thinks your properties were and what the government thinks your properties were. Right? Well, Robert Kleinlein, one of the stores, he had, a, he had to uh, he had to put a property tax. Okay? And the guy suggested that the, it, it's a percentage of the, the value of the property. Mm -hmm. The guy suggested that the owner of the property appraise their own property for the tax. Okay? Mm -hmm. but there's a gimmick built into it. The gimmick is that any time the government can buy the property for that price mm -hmm. any time. Mm -hmm. Rather than take the tax. Yeah, that's monstrous. That's not. That's not like just so Heinlein. Yeah. That, that was. Uh, that was uh, that's where I heard. I haven't heard it anywhere else. Yeah, Gordon Tullock. Where is it? Two distinguished public choice theorists, alleged free market people. Uh, Gordon, Professor Gordon Tullock, and now at George Mason and Armin Alci and UCLA, came up independently with the same nonsense. Um, the, they consider this the ideal tax. Do you think that's nonsense? Well, it's uh, yeah, I'm a lot higher. It's it's. I like it because it uses negative feedback, and so it stabilizes itself. Huh? Okay, it uses negative feedback, so it stabilizes itself. The guy tries to cheat the government by putting too much. Yeah. Oh, no, she cheated the government. Example of using the terms. Stable, stable evil is still evil. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let me, let me just, let me just give, give you an anecdote about this, okay? So Tullock and Alchin came in independently, and it was a Mont Pelerin Society meeting, which is a group of. Relatively free market economists now. I mean, it's, it's very watered down. Everybody to the right of uh, you know, Trudeau can be in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, you, uh, uh, Alci, uh, Alci and Antella came up with this theory. So this is the perfect tax. This is the voluntary tax. This is the <laughs> ideal tax. Uh, where you, uh, you get everybody to assess your property tax, assess your property, and then you pay uh, whatever tax is on it. And if the tax, if you assess your property, and, you know, $20, you pay a very low tax, but then the government, either the, the government, you have to sell it to the government until the next person who comes along at, the, at that price. Uh, if you don't want to sell something that's really priceless to you, you have to set you know, $2 billion on it, and then you have to pay the 10% or 2% or whatever, $2 billion. So poor Professor Hayek is now the, the dean of the oldest living Austrian economist. So my, my, but, but, but in that case, I have this precious library. I love this library. I've got 10,000 books or whatever, and that means in order to save my library, I have to value it uh, $2 million. I wouldn't have to, have to go to the poorhouse. And the answer was, who cares about your library? 
that was the great so called free market <laughs> answer. You can write your blankety blank library. So that's the difference between the property rights approach and a, you know, whatever Friedmanite public choice approach where you're looking at the tech, technicians trying to maximize government revenue or maximize something. Which is exactly what Highlands trying to do in this example. Maximize government revenue. Right. Okay, break? Yeah, we're going to take a break. Ten minutes and back, we'll be back. And anybody... Well, I think we should press on. Um, yes. <laughs> one thing, I just want to talk to Mary with the break, but go. Uh, it might clarify this, this good question, homogeneity question. Is again, from the point of view of the, of the, you know, the actor, the, the uh, consumer or whatever. So that uh, uh, Mary was asking me, well, what if uh, you have 20 ice cream cones which are all the same, but aren't they really different in the sense that one is in a different, occupy a slightly different uh, space and uh, to the left of the other one. But from the point of view of the consumer, it doesn't really care. In other words, for him, it's homogeneous. He doesn't care which ice cream ice cream cone he gets at Phoenix or whatever, you know, whatever the store is. So again, it's from the point of the whole thing is from the point of view of the actor, the actual person doing all this stuff. It's not from the point of view of molecular physics or objective uh, of the objective properties of the object of the, of the entity. I hope that clears up a little bit. Well, I'm still saying you have to you have to look at it as a an approximation because there's no way physically different things can ever be the same and evaluated the same. Even if the same waitress comes along and hands them a second ice cream cone and so on, it's it's at a different time. It's a different ice cream cone. He's he's but, gonna feel different, his but he might, yeah, but he, uh, he might say you might feel different at that time. Not necessarily he might feel exactly the same. But I to apply it and and uh, to apply it to the empirical situation as a as a as an applied economist, so to speak, then you have to make a judgment. Well, I agree. Yeah. You approximate. You, you you say, well, we won't go beneath this level where... We don't have to, because the acting itself doesn't. I'd love you trying to approximate. What I got worked out in between after yeah. talking to you is, if, I, if I'm sitting at home and I say, I want an ice cream cone, at that point in time, all my spin cones are the same. They are all homogeneous units. But I want to walk together. So now, it's oh, now all the ice cream cones that are within walking oh, distance right. are homogeneous units. Mm -hmm. I decide to go north, now it's all those within my, and so on, and it, the closer you get to making the exact purchase, the fewer homogeneous units there are in the good, until you make that final choice, and now it is not just anyone, it's the one you bought. You <laughs> 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 Perhaps we should get to the purpose of why we look at the goods that way. Yeah. And that is that it's exactly. a good way to refute government intervention is like the economists do. Who say would say that it should cost the same amount of money in the name of fairness yeah. to mail a letter from Toronto to London as it does to mail a letter from oh. Hamilton to Sault Ste. Marie? Right. That's because they are applying externally a value to it, and, and right. it's not the actor that's making the decision. Right. right. Uh, well, that's one of the purposes. I don't think it's the only purpose. One of the yeah. first purpose is to get a true body of knowledge, so to speak, to build up an analysis of the uh, economic economic system. It then turns out, however, that has Political applications, uh, all this stuff. You know. So it's sort of a dual purpose. Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, to press on, um, the um, given the homogeneous units, uh, let's say Von uh, like, uh, one of the great masters of Western economics. Uh, I should really mention who they are. To begin with. Uh, Carl Menger, our beloved founder, uh, who taught uh, economics at the University of Vienna, and therefore was to, it's called the Austrian School, um, wrote, his, wrote his book in 18, I think 1871, um, called the uh, Principles of the Economy. I think just different translations, foundations of economics, whatever. So this is uh, <coughs> this, this is a, he's a great founder. Of this. Science, I recommend the book. This will be economics is that cool. I certainly recommend the book. It's a great book. Marvelous book. It's the foundation of the whole thing. His great student and disciple, William von Bumbarbeck, also succeeded him at the University of Vienna, or continued also toward the University of Vienna. And wrote his great masterpiece, Capital and Interest, which goes into price theory as well, and also utility and price theory, and also 
discover the laws of capital and uh, interest and uh, wrote from 1880s to about 1914. So the different editions of the book so it's around that, in that period. So von Walberg's famous example uh, is horses. Uh, I've been as a homogeneous horses what you do with them. I like to use laws that don't make much difference. Uh, <clears throat> so you get a, a um, you get Crusoe here who's <coughs> he has a set of laws. I don't, you can say a set of laws. I'm trying to get some the units here from this point of view. There's a certain group of laws. Or I call it the log, just, just to make it up. And he can use it for, we're assuming here, he can use it for many, many different uses. He can take the same unit of stuff and use it for different uses. He, got, he has a priority of uses. Okay. Most important, let's say, is cooking tonight's fire. He can have meat, which is not raw. Raw. Okay, cooking fire. Nice fire. <laughs> this is, so this is his top priority. Second, second rank. Uh, if he has another, another uh, set of logs, it is uh, I would say adding an extension to his log cabin or building his log cabin. Third rank might be uh, storing logs with the barn ice fire. He doesn't have to shuck around and you know, take an axe and chop wood to mark, so take a rest on that. So, okay, so you have a little bit, a little bit of savings here. <clears throat> and uh, cooking tomorrow's fire. And, I don't know, you can, you can add different stuff. And there's all, let's say, building a fence around this thing so you can have to keep the wolves out or whatever. Okay, so, <laughs> of course, different groups of them might have you know, different order of priorities here already. And fifth, something that you always wanted to do, which we'll get to eventually, is building a boardwalk so he doesn't have to have his toes full of sand out of the beach. <laughs> Obviously, frivolous, but more affluent. <laughs> Building a raft to get back to the world. Building a raft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So he ranks them, let's say one, two, three, four, five. By the way, an enormous amount of trouble with them, enormous amount of headaches in right, corporate economics by people claiming you can measure this. You would have solved a lot of set ABC in lexicographical order. At any rate, this is strictly ordinal. It's ranking them in priority. And uh, so now the point is this, if he loses one, let's say he has these five <coughs> logs, they're all there, he's ready. He's gonna do this first, the second, etc., etc. One washes away, a tidal wave comes and washes away one of the sets of law. Which use is he gonna give up? He's obviously gonna give up the lowest ranking use. He's not gonna give this up. He has only four instead of five that he originally had. He's gonna give up the boardwalk while he'll wait right, until he gets another set in a couple of weeks or something. So he gives up then. If he has five sets of logs, he'll give up his supply is five, supply being defined as your stock, the amount available of homogeneous units, <coughs> look good. His supply is five, and so he gives up, if he loses the, one of these logs, he doesn't give up, at least, he gives up the least important use to him, which is the fifth. So, on the other hand, he's got only two sets of logs, and one washes away or loses it, he's going to give up the second highest value and keep the first one. So we conclude from this that the more the more logs he's got, the lower the rank of value to him of any one set of logs. Right? In other words, he's got ten logs, he only has to give up the tenth usage, right? Who knows about it? Is? It's building a little birdhouse or something like that. So so he deduced from that the famous law of diminishing margin utility, <coughs> which uh, was discovered in different way by Menger and Walross and Jevons third <coughs> Neglected figure, and uh, about the same period, which is the old dimensional margin utility. Which says that the greater the supply of a good, Supply being defined as the amount it has available, the greater the amount of supply of the good, the lower <coughs> the value of each unit. And of course, conversely, 
the lower the supply of the good, the greater the value of each unit, just the other side of the coin. Uh, and it's called the law of diminishing margin utility, where value is called utility, and, and uh, the word marginal comes in as reference to a unit. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit as to why this comes in, but anyway. Marginal means at the margin. You're considering the next group of laws what to do with it. You're considering the next portion of ice cream, whether to buy it or not. So, they, so people act in, in, in the real world in terms of units. So, so it's then called the law of diminishing margin to look. Uh, the, uh, one of the important reasons for this is this. This, uh, before Adam Smith, is supposed to be the founder of economics, really wasn't. That's a whole other shtick. Uh, the, uh, and I, I'm so sure you've all heard the name, but anyway, Adam Smith wrote his famous Wealth of Nations in 1776, Scotsman, and for various reasons, which we still don't really completely sure about, but can guess that, Smith, instead of founding economics, rolled economics back. In other words, economics took a big step backward after the Wealth of Nations. Uh, French, various French economists, for example, and scholastic, medieval scholastic economists on the continent had already discovered almost this Wealth of Nations and Nations They hadn't gotten to the margin part. They got everything else pretty well set, namely that the greater the supply of a good, the less the value would be. They didn't get in terms of units so much, but that, that's really just the last cornerstone, the last stone in the edifice. So before Smith, the general was figured the value of a good on the market, the price of a good on the market, is determined by the utility and the supply. How much is available, how much people will evaluate the supply, and that if you have greater supply, it will be valued less. Okay. Smith himself, Smith's teachers, Scotland, Hutchison, Francis Hutchison, also had the same view. And Smith himself, in his previous writings, 20 years before that, unpublished lectures, also had. I guess the wealth of nations takes like 200 years backward. And he says, we can't figure out it's the famous diamond bread paradox, the diamond water paradox. This is the so-called paradox of value invented by Smith. And like most paradoxes, it's, it's a false problem. Yeah. The paradox of value is this. Look, he says, we have bread. Bread is a staff of life. It's extremely useful. It's, uh, you know, people die without it. It's tremendously useful. It's philosophically magnificent. And yet, you look on the market, it's very cheap. You know, 20 cents a loaf of bread was in those days. Uh, so, they, so that's, so, and the other thing, so you have bread which is, has a high use value. Let's see what okay. Bread, high use value. And then you have diamonds. Diamonds are a frippery. I realize this is very important, by the way, and why this occurred. Smith was a devout Calvinist Presbyterian, tended to be against consumption anyway. Consumption. Diamonds are frippery. Yeah, it's uh, sinful. Okay. And here is sinful diamonds. Which he says that has no use whatsoever. He actually says that diamonds have zero use value, almost zero. <laughs> uh, and yet diamonds are very expensive. They're valued very highly on the market. You know, one diamond costs ten thousand dollars. This is a paradox. How come red high use value, low exchange value? You mean? The price on the market, how much will exchange for it? And yet, diamonds have zero use value, almost zero use value, negligible use value, and have a very high exchange value. And he said he couldn't solve this, and therefore he just drops out. He says, This is it. And his analysis of consumption and consumers drop out. In classical economics, which means Smith, Ricardo, and Mill in Great Britain, they don't talk about consumers because they can't figure it out. It's a paradox, it's a peculiarity of the market. It's a strange anomaly or whatever. So this, of course, leaves total hostage open to socialists or leftists later on. We can both see. Uh, Veblen, in many ways more aggravating than Marx even, uh, forced on Veblen, uh, said, look, coins the idea that there's two kinds of production. There's production for use and production for profit. There's production for profit, you, you can go for exchange value for market values. As production for use, where you're really producing what people really use and need. need. So this, this sets up the dichotomy between use and, and market or exchange value, which is extremely pernicious politically and history of social thought. Uh, okay, what was the resolution of the paradox which predecessors and Smith and Salford essentially arrived at? Basically, is this that we don't 
And in the real world, this is again the Austrian approach which looks at the individual, the acting individual, how he or she chooses. Namely, we don't choose classes of goods. We don't sit around as philosophers and say, which is more important to mankind, bread or diamonds? And then let us choose between them. Bread is better. That's not the way, that's not the sort of choice that we're, we're confronted with on the market. If indeed the angel Gabriel came down, this is one of my angel Gabriel examples. <laughs> <laughs> if the angel Gabriel came down and said, Earthlings, you know, gather all the earthlings together for TV or something, and said, Earthlings, you're now presented with a choice. I now present you with this choice. From now on, you have to give up either all the bread in the world now and forever, or also all the diamonds in the world now and forever. And probably most of them say, let's give up diamonds. Oh, well, bread is more useful in this philosophic or sense of a whole class of products. But we're not confronted with that kind of a choice. The choice we're confronted with in the market is how much we pay for a loaf of bread, how much we pay for a diamond. <clears throat> and so, in the market, in other words, we make marginal choices of units, which is where the marginal unit thing comes in. <clears throat> and so, uh, what happens is that, okay, you got the law of diminishing mar margin utility. It so happens in the world that, <clears throat> that there's a lot of bread around, okay? There's millions of loaves of bread, wonder bread, silver cup. You know, pumperage form, but except there's a raw pumpernickel, etc. Okay, so we have a, a diagram, a simple diagram. Look at this. We have margin utility or whatever value, and it's okay, and quantity in the x-axis. And we have a. We might start off. We have only one loaf of bread, and I might not have much. You know, some that might be enormous. Or actually, it might be enormous. Still, in all, you wind up. With quantity is so big. You wind up with a fairly low exchange value of any given loaf. They have an enormous supply, two, 10 million loaves, whatever it is, of bread. Therefore, the, the, each person, the value of each loaf is fairly, fairly small. On the other hand, diamonds might be, if you have only one diamond in the world versus one piece of bread, and one loaf of bread, you might choose a loaf of bread. But there's so few diamonds around, very scarce, that do something like that. So we're up here. And so that one carat of diamonds is, of course, worth a lot more the higher value in the market than one loaf of bread. <clears throat> so the relative scarcity of two things becomes the key to the whole situation. Once you look at the acting individuals, you say, on the market, rather than consider the thing as a philosophic, holistic, philosophic class, then you can solve the paradox. <clears throat> and uh, the mystery of why Smith himself has sort of seen the light, but funny before comes up with this. I think part of it, I don't know, but part of it is this. There's this Presbyterian outlook that, uh, that somehow that, you know, it's frippery and that, you know, it should be somehow higher value, more useful. Okay, so this, um, we're looking at another way, another famous example is water. Water, I wouldn't say it's free, but it's more or less so low, so low in value, there's so much of it, that you go to, go to the fountain and get water. You don't have to pay for each, each glass, each cup. It's, Extremely abundant out here somewhere. However, if you're walking across the Libyan desert and you have one canteen, one cup is of enormously, extremely important. You, know, you pay two million dollars, your whole life savings for one cup. You pay zero or next to nothing for one cup here. So, because it's, because the amount available to you, you know, there's this, you know, very team, extremely small and way up on your utility scale, the margin utility scale. So the relative scarcity becomes the key thing here, and the Therefore, and they, so the value on the market, which the exchange value, which is the price okay, of the market, becomes determined by two things, two forces at work here. One is the amount available at any given time, the supply, the price on the y-axis now, and quantity of the good on the x-axis, and <coughs> And the supply of a good, conceptually, we don't know exactly what it is, it could be anything, but conceptually we could find out. Okay. Two million loaves of Wonder Bread, 100,000 pounds of peaches, whatever. We have demand of evaluation determined by the law of dimension market utility, so that at, uh, <coughs> looking at it, the, the greater the supply, the less the lower will be the valuation, and the lower will be the price. <coughs> Uh, there's also a common sense way of looking at this thing, of course. You don't want to look at the law of diminishing margin utility and how you arrive at it. At a higher price, less will be purchased. At a lower price, more will be purchased. It's saying a similar thing. Exactly. That's the other way of looking at it. So this is the so-called demand curve. It's how much will be purchased at any given price 
either by one person or by an aggregate by all people in the market, all consumers, to sum up. You know, if you have, <coughs> if there are five consumers thinking about whether to buy one and wondering about it, conceptually they arrive at each, each individual demand curve, how much they pay it, buy it at even price. And some guy, some person might be a marginal wonder bread person who will only buy it if it gets down to 50 cents a loaf. Somebody else might be a fanatic and buy it if it's up to $10 a loaf. And you, add, you wind up with sort of a falling demand, so-called falling demand curve, right? Any good. <coughs> so these are the two forces which determine any give any price of any any product, any good or service on the market. Uh, <coughs> the uh, and these are the only two forces determined. Demand for it, how much will be purchased uh, at any given point, and the supply of it, which is the amount available. And we, now this gives us our famous, our famous demand supply curves. Now, I, I haven't talked about Friday because it'll probably take too long to go on. In, in my courses, I suppose, bring in Friday and talk about who's on Friday exchange. It's important, but I just want to leap a, leap a little bit here. And, uh, Although we can say in this sense about exchange, I think it's important to say before we get to analyze price further, that all the whole market is like a lattice work okay, of, of it's like a spider web or lattice work of millions of different unit exchanges. Uh, <coughs> so you have uh, you have me buying a newspaper, let's say. So I, I'm exchanging uh, 30 cents in New York Times or whatever. And in this case, where both parties benefit, I prefer, I have well, the two values here are involved here actually, all right? There's me, there's me, I, I rank 30 cents. I rank 30 cents. I rank the New York Times higher than 30 cents. I put this in parentheses because I haven't gotten yet. This is me just before I buy the paper. And I'm looking at these things. I, 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 would feel, I would be better off, psychically better off, of a higher utility, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> if I spend the 30 cents on the New York Times. Because I, I value the New York Times higher, more highly than I value the 30 cents. On the other hand, the news dealer, <clears throat> it's precisely the opposite situation. And he. Uh, he values the 30 cents, which he hasn't got yet, more highly than the New York Times. He's got plenty of New York Times. It's not his problem. He wants, he wants to get money for it. So we then have here an exchange. This is a unit exchange. Both parties are better off. Okay? As we complete the exchange, which is a transfer of ownership, like an exchange is, it's sort of like buying a house, except they have a notarized deed and all that. You don't have to do that. That goes. So just yeah. give him the 30 cents. He gives you the Times. That's it. You don't have to have a lawyer or a fleet of accountants intervening in this. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I'm better off on a higher utility point, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm better off by getting the New York Times. I'm benefiting. He's benefiting by getting the 30 cents. We have a mutually beneficial exchange. Both, both parties to it go higher on their value scales. They both achieve accomplish more of their goals. And uh, so what we have here, the conditions for a successful exchange are two people, there are two people involved here, and two, com and two commodities, two goods. In this case, it's two people, I mean, and it's the two goods, so 30 cents in the New York Times. And we exchange these two things, we're both better off. Uh, the, market, the free market is, is a lattice work, millions of these exchanges going on all the time. So uh, if, uh, if somebody works for IBM, let's say, you're selling your labor service to IBM, you're getting money. You prefer getting money to keep, not selling labor service. They prefer getting labor service and getting them, than, than uh, keeping the money. Okay. So in each set, in each set of cases, you have two people, or in the case of IBM, a group of people represented by a corporation, uh, <clears throat> and making these exchanges. In each case, each person is better off. Each unit, entity is better off. So we have a situation of the free market, even, even with that, the efficiency of the free market, all the rest of it. At each step of the way, each, each, each person maximizes getting better and better, uh, higher utility each, at each step uh, of the transaction. Um, in case of Crusoe and Friday, each one is better off on exchange fish for meat or whatever, whatever the uh, exchange is. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> and we already have here, so we, oh, so we need that as two, we need that for a successful exchange, the reverse inequality of values of the two people. What we need is for me 
So evaluate the two things differently than him. In other words, I have to, if both, if both of us prefer 30 cents to the New York Times, there's no basis for a transaction. I have to prefer the New York Times to 30 cents. If I prefer 30 if I have the same relative value scale as he's got, we don't make any deal. So what you have to find for, for any exchange is a reverse inequality of value of values. <coughs> Because values are subjective, they're ordinal, they're value scales are part of each individual. Now again, once you state this, it might seem self-evident, but this already wipes out a huge amount of economics, history of economic thought. Okay. It's been wiped off the books. Right? It's, not, it's like all great, great discoveries or inventions, they're only self-evident after you, after you look at them, after they or even stated. Before that, it's not so self-evident. So what happens is that well, for example, if you take Karl Marx, Das Kapital, very interesting book. You don't have to read more than the first two pages because the prime fallacy of the thing is it's in the first couple of pages. I'm not saying you shouldn't read the rest of it. If you're a masochist, you can go ahead and do it. But the prime fallacy, which is true of most economic fallacies, most fallacies are in the assumptions of the first couple of pages. The rest is spitting out. So, he starts off as follows. There's, a, there's an exchange. He doesn't use newspaper, whatever. But he says two things exchange for each other. Let's say 30 cents for New York Times, or one pound of bread for two dozen eggs, or whatever. And he says because they exchange for, for each other, he says they must be equal in value. Yeah. So <clears throat> then he says, okay, what is there about fish and horses, or whatever? Uh, to get back beyond money, let's say fish and horses, or eggs and butter, or whatever, eggs and horses, whatever. What is there in these two products if, they, if one is equal to the other uh, that, that make them equal? What is there to make them equal in value? And he looks and he says, well, it can't be weight. Weight is totally different. It can't be volume. Volume is totally different. And he winds up uh, the quantity of labor hours and body of the two products. That's, of course, also the second crazy solution. But the point is, the whole problem is posed incorrectly because they're not equal in value. They wouldn't be exchanged if they were equal in value. You know, basis for any exchange at all. If they're really equal, why bother going to the cost of finding the other guy and exchanging? It's like, it's like saying, I have a nickel, and you have a nickel, and it's, it's been, they're numismatically the same thing. I'd say they're both the same data set, but there's no point in me going around exchanging a nickel for your nickel. Unless, you know, it's some bizarre personal reason. Generally, there's no reason just to sort of pain in the neck. It's a, it's a waste of. That's what now, now called transaction cost. So uh, no point to it. Okay. And so exchanges are, if they're things, two things were really equal, there wouldn't be exchange at all, be equal in value. So that exchange requires this double inequality. So we can toss out the whole thing. The rest of the Marxism can be tossed out just on that basis alone. It's like the other labor quantity, labor and all the rest of the stuff that goes into it. <clears throat> so uh, now more, uh, a less extreme version, the classical economists, Smith and Ricardo, had a less extreme model. They actually had some of that too. I mean, Marx, in many ways, Marx was a, was a sort of consistent Ricardian, or Smithian, carrying this thing to its logical conclusion. Uh, one variant of Smith and Ricardo has the quantity of labor hours. They're looking for some way to, how do you embody this? What's the physical thing that embodies this value? <coughs> uh, another less extreme variant, coming later on to Alfred Marshall, was uh, cost of production. Of course, the production must be the same. The same quantity of uh, labor pain. There's all sorts of ways of looking at this. They're all fallacious because there's no, they're not equal to begin with. Okay, so that's, that's uh, okay. That's another example of how these things seem to be recognized, seem to be very simple, uh, have uh, important consequences. Uh, <clears throat> okay, getting back to uh, price price determination. Uh, Supply and demand become the two determinants of price, and then become, and this is not just Austrian, this is generally accepted, so I don't think we have to go completely into this thing. But anyway, and, well, there's a variant here, which is not, which is Austrian. Uh, the, um, the market price, the day to day market price, which we call market equilibrium price, unfortunately, because there's another equilibrium which is unsound, so it's, again, it's very confusing. The day to day market price will be, will tend to be, very quickly, the intersection point, supply curve and demand, supply and demand curve. This will be what prices will be. Very, the day-to-day -day market equilibrium. 
Uh, I don't know if I have any science to this or if you probably won't this. Do you, know, you all know it? Raise your hands if you don't all know it. Those who don't know it already, raise their hands. Everybody knows it. Okay. What are we supposed to know? Well, <laughs> why it is that the market price will be in it until you hear second price. Okay, I go very quickly on this. So the price is higher than this. If this is peaches, let's say, and peaches are 60 cents a pound. I don't know what peaches are, let's say 60 cents a pound. That's, that's the equilibrium price. If the price is higher, then people will, will only buy, they'll buy much less than the 200,000 pounds available. They'll buy only 150,000 pounds. This will be an unsold surplus. Does anything a businessman hate is buying something and having, not having it be sold or you know, nobody buying it? Unsold surplus piles up. In order, in order to eliminate the unsold surplus, this unwanted thing, these things piling up that you're not selling, you cut your price. As you cut the price, more is purchased. And finally, lo and behold, you get down to the equilibrium price, uh, there's no more unsold surplus. So the tendency on the market then is to wipe out very quickly unsold surpluses. All you need to do it is for businessmen to prefer to make money and not lose money. So called profit motive, or profit and loss motive. To make money and not to lose it. Okay. <laughs> this is 